to the pastors, servants of God, saints of God. Uh, greetings to you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior. It's good to be in the God presence of God, and I thank God for the great privilege, and uh, thank God and thank the church for this opportunity. The title of my message is uh, "Sharing the Sufferings of Christ." Those of us who were here last night might be wondering the same message. I believe it's God's will that we listen to the same thing. So we go to the epistle of First Peter, and uh, I would like to say a small introduction to the epistle. So the Christian church, in the early church, uh, they were considered as a sect of the Jewish faith. And the early, early period, they were not having any persecution. Since the Romans did, Romans did not... Uh, Since the Romans did not like uh, identify them as a separate faith, so they were not having any persecution. And uh, so they were having good period. And after a while, they started to face persecution after the Romans found out that this is a separate entity from the Jewish faith. To, to Christians in that time, I believe it was about like starting about 80, 50s or late 50s or 60s, it is to those people that Paul, Peter is writing to share in the sufferings of Christ. And uh, I thank God for giving this message and confirming this message that this is a really the God's word for us. And I would uh, request all of you to pay close attention as we will be going through a lot of verses. So Christianity, once it was found out there was a separate faith, it was completely banned. And the Romans called it a dangerous superstition. And they banned it. And a lot of Christians had to, uh, like, just like everybody else, they had to offer incense to the Caesar. So they had to call Caesar as a Lord. And to so, such Christians, Peter is saying, sanctify Lord, as sanctify Christ as the Lord. And many of them died as a result. And uh, they were facing persecution in that way. But we face a different persecution. We find the same, we found the same... Uh, choice when we are given today. Do you want to follow the world or do you want to follow Christ? In that moment, we got to select Christ. We got to choose Christ and we got to sanctify Christ as Lord. We see in the Old Testament, uh, Israel faced the same thing in Mount Carmel where they had to choose between Baal or between Yehovah. So we have to choose and in that choosing, there is a suffering because uh, like we heard yesterday, in all the synoptic gospel, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to follow me, he should, take up his he should deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. So taking up the cross and uh, following daily involves a lot of suffering. And that's the suffering I'm trying to speak about today. Just like the in ancient Christians had a choice to worship Caesar, we have the choice today. And let's make the right decision. So in the, uh, the Luke, it sees, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he, might deny, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So there's two words I want all of us to learn, especially the young people. We might already know it, but it's good to learn again. is sanctification and separation. Separation is separating ourselves from the world. And sanctification is uh, sanctifying us to the God, to Lord. These two things are very uh, costly in various degrees, and we all have to do that. So why? Because we are called to be holy. Just like the one who called us is holy, we are supposed to be holy. And uh, moving on, let's go to the next verse, please. Next slide. The first point is, suffering is followed by glory. For that, let's read 1 Peter 4, verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. I believe uh, we all face sufferings, choices in our life today, but there is a factor, there is a degree to which we share the sufferings of Christ, we'll be that much rejoicing at his coming. Not all of us will have the same, the degree of suffering, and uh, we should always be happy to suffer for the Lord. So Peter was a, he was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and sufferings of Christ was just not the six hours on he spent on the cross. It was throughout his life. He said in Luke 12, verses 50, 
but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Christ was born like a sacrificial animal to pay for the sins of the world, and he suffered throughout his life. And we are called to be following in his example. But that's not the end of it. Christ's glory was also revealed for a brief moment. And Peter, James, and John, they were able to get a glimpse of the glory that was being revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration. We see when he was praying, Jesus, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and flashing like lightning. Luke 9, 29. So we see Jesus gave them a glimpse of the glory that was to be following the sufferings that he had to endure on the cross and also throughout his own life. So we read in Romans 8, 17 to 18, we read, For indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of his present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Amen? We all have to know that suffering is followed by glory. Next slide, please. The second point is suffering finds favor with God. That's 1 Peter 2, verses 18 to 20. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but to all, but to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. But if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated? but you endure it with patience. But when you endure doing what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. And this finds favor with God. Amen? So patient, uh, favor means charis or grace. So when we suffer patiently, we find grace from God. And God will give us the grace. This is talking about servants and masters, and we all uh, know that that's not very common anymore. We are all working in different fields. We may have a difficult uh, manager to work with, a supervisor, and we all know that, uh, how difficult it is to work with them. So we are called to be suffering for, the, for doing what is right and to have, maintain a good conscience towards God. And God will give us the grace for that. Even if our managers are unreasonable or crooked or uh, wicked people, we just have to bear with them patiently because God gives grace to us for that. This doesn't apply just to the uh, school, uh, the work, but also to the school and colleges. Because we might face friends, as young people, we might face friends or uh, people who are not very godly, and we have to keep separation from them. And that separation involves uh, quite a bit of suffering, and we should know that that is not without reward. And God will give us the grace for that. In Colossians 3, verse 23 to 24, we see, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, not for the men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ that you serve. Amen? Amen. So whatever work we do, it doesn't have to be, let it be secular work or ministry work or anything. We need to know that we'll get an inheritance. And it's a wonderful deal for us because to be faithful in a secular job, we'll get the reward as inheritance. That's a very big deal for us, and uh, God is so merciful for that. So to the next slide, please. Suffering is following the example of Christ. And for this, there are two verses, two chapters. First um, Peter 2, verses 21 to 24. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed." It's a blessed uh, word of God in there. And uh, chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, we say, But even if you suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. 
but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. So this is a blessed exhortation to all of us to know that suffering is following the example of Christ. We are given six things not to do and one thing to do. The six things are, we should not commit sin. If reviled, we should not revile in return. We should not threaten while suffering. Our lips should not uh, speak deceit. We should not fear the intimidation and should not be troubled. The thing that we should do is sanctify Lord, sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. So as I said earlier, Christians were forced to burn incense as a civic duty every, uh, on a regular basis, just like everybody else. And many of them chose not to burn incense to Caesar, but to die for the Lord. We may not face the same degree of persecution today here in the West, but we should follow the example of Christ. One point I want to mention a little bit in detail is how to not commit sin, because that is the first word that is mentioned as uh, following the example of Christ. Even if we forget all the things in this message, I want all of us to remember that. So we need to know how sin works. For that, let's go to James chapter one, verse 14 to 15. It says, but each of us is tempted when he's carried away by his own lust, and when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So that is a way by which sin works. There's a temptation doesn't creep up on us. Some temptation doesn't jump on us immediately. It creeps up on us slowly. And there's a conception period for the lust. And during that time, we are faced with a choice. The choice is, do you want to go with the world or do you want to sanctify Christ as a Lord in your hearts? So we can immediately pray, get on our knees and pray and ask for God's grace. And he will definitely give his grace to overcome that temptation, amen? And we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So we are called to arm ourselves with the same purpose. The same purpose that was in Christ it's like almost like a weapon almost. We're supposed to arm ourselves. Christ died to sin. Christ died for our sins. And we are also called to die to sin and live to righteousness. Moving on to the next point. Next slide, please. We should not be ashamed to suffer as a Christian. For that, let me read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. Make sure that none of us suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Amen. It's very evident from verse 15 that we should not be suffering for doing what is wrong, but we should suffer for doing what is right, if it's God's will. One thing I want to mention from verse 16 is the word Christian. And uh, this is going a little bit off topic, but I felt that I have to share it, and I'm sharing it, that's why. So the word Christian appears only three times in the New Testament, as many of us know. And uh, we know disciples were called Christians in Antioch, in Acts 11. So there are many people in today's world who call themselves Christians. But are they actually Christians? Let's find out. To be a Christian, we know that you have to be born again by listening to the word of God, by believing the word of God. After born, being born again, we have to be partaking in the believer's baptism. So these two things are the minimum requirements to be a disciple of Christ or to become a Christian. In Mark 16, 16, we read, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Child baptism and a lot of other things does not count and it's, they're not saved yet. I wanted to point us to the deception, which is tying up with my final point. It's called uh, ecumenism. It is a movement that is getting strength today in today's world and is pushing outwardly to create unity among all those who are calling themselves as Christian. A lot of people call themselves Christians, but we just found out from the Bible, from Jesus' own words, 
that only those who believe and are baptized are Christians. So the ecumenism is pushing towards a unity of some sort among all the churches. And I have many, many uh, Christian leaders whom I respected once. I later found out that they were pushing ecumenism all throughout their life. And I don't uh, support them anymore or even watch their messages. Even though ecumenism is outwardly showing for a unity, inwardly I believe it has one purpose and that is to bring the apostate church under the Roman Catholic religion. And I know this might be a little bit more straightforward, but I believe this is absolute truth. So we have to be wary of that. And uh, one of the ways by which Satan, I believe, is working is by a series called Chosen. This is a practical uh, exhortation from the message. So please take it in that spirit. Chosen is sold everywhere. I go to any Christian store. I let it be online, let it be a physical store. The first thing you open the door, they will be showing you a series called Chosen. And uh, it's being used by a lot of people to push for ecumenism. And the actor portraying Jesus is not a Christian, according to Matthew 6, Mark 6, 16, but a Catholic, and uh, he has the blessing of the Pope. 95% of the show in that series is not from the Bible, according to the director himself. So we should be realizing that that is a different gospel and a different Jesus and is not leading us to the truth. And none of us, especially the young people, I believe a lot of sincere young people tend to watch that series and get deceived. If you want to know more about the Bible and Jesus, we should read the Gospels and Synoptic Gospels. So we should not be deceived by such uh, subtle deceptions. Let's reject ecumenism, even if we have to suffer for it, because we should not be ashamed to suffer as a true Christian. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, we see do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? I won't go on reading the whole verse, but it's a very important verse because it says in the end, in verse 18, says the Lord Almighty. And that's a very rare mention of the Lord Almighty in the New Testament apart from Revelation. So it's very, very important that all of us study that verse. And other, other translation is called, do not be unequally yoked. I was thinking, what does unequally yoke means? And I thought, and God put in my heart, it's like, we are under the yoke of Christ. The yoke of Christ, he said, my yoke is easy, I'm a burden, it's light. But some other people who call themselves Christian, but not really Christians, they are under a yoke of slavery. But we who are called into liberty should not go back into the yoke of slavery. We should not be unequally yoked. I'm not calling that all of us have family and friends, who are not saved yet, we should also intercede for them and pray for them and speak the gospel to them, but we should have friendship with them, but not spiritual fellowship, thereby deceiving ourselves. And moving on to the last and final point, is a concluding point. It's uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 11. Be sober, be on the alert, you adversary the devil, Prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings, same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we are, we are given a final like a concluding remarks by Peter that we are not alone in our suffering. All of us, all throughout the world, a lot of believers, all believers who are living for godly life are being persecuted in one way or the other. So we are not alone in our suffering against sin or fight against sin. And one more thing, our suffering is not forever. It's for a short while, it's for a little while. The suffering is for a little while, but the glory is eternal, amen? So we had to look forward to that glory and it's not nothing, any suffering in this life is not compared, it can't be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And uh, I'll read chapter, verse 10 again. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who he called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen and establish you. 
I'll go through all the points really quickly. The first point is suffering is followed by glory. The second point is suffering give, finds its favor with God. The third point is suffering is following in the example of Christ. The fourth point is we should not be ashamed to suffer as a Christian. And finally, suffering is not forever. Let's bow down our hearts in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the precious word you've given us, Father. Help us to, Father, obey your word, Father. Give us the grace for that, Father. Lord, I ask you that if it's your will, Lord, help us to suffer for doing what is right and not what is wrong, Father. Help us to grow in sanctification, Father. Help us to be following your example in sharing your sufferings, Father. And help us all to be ready for your soon return, Father. We give you all the glory and honor. Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.